Welcome to TopCast, episode 98, and appropriately, as we get close to the century, the 100th episode of TopCast, a podcast ostensibly called The Theory of Knowledge Cast, we reach chapter 5 of The Science of Can and Can't, and that chapter, chapter number 5, is called simply Knowledge. I say it's appropriate because The Science of Can and Can't is, of course, one of the newest, deepest theories of physics. And in fact, this makes it one of the broadest theories of physics as well. And the science of Ken and Kant construct a theory brings in knowledge within the orbit of physics, which is amazing. Epistemology is being, if it isn't already, being subsumed by some fundamental physics. Fundamental physics in the form of construct a theory. So this means our Popperian vision of knowledge, which itself is the most modern vision of knowledge hitherto, has now been given a 21st century update by David Deutsch and Chiara Marletta. So we're going to explore that today. And this really appeals to me because like so many people who are drawn to science in the first place because, well, yes, it's fun, but also because it subtracts out so much of people's emotions and feelings and opinions on any given topic that might otherwise lead them astray in not thinking clearly and objectively about any issue at hand. And in a sense, this is timely, and I often don't like to talk about timely things on this podcast, but this one might stand the test of time, unfortunately, because right now we are in the midst of what I think is a real pushback against anything that might be considered rational, reasonable, objective. We are told that so much of our politics, history, and even science is about feelings and emotions. This is not the way that science and reason should be. Sure, emotions are important, but they don't have primacy. At best, in places like science, they can be an indication of what one might want to pursue or how one might be curious about a particular topic. But they are not the thing that decides what is true. But we are so often now taught about what's true for me or true for you or true for the individual rather than actually objectively true and known. These are separate things. And as always, when any emotion comes up at any time, it really needs to be interpreted in the light of a good explanation for us to really understand what the meaning of any particular emotion might be at root level. So there has been a resurgent in recent years of subjectivity. There can be many reasons for this, I suppose, but to put a spin on it from actual epistemology, too much emphasis being placed on so-called beliefs personal opinions and subjective emotions. And this stems deep down, in my opinion, in a deep way, from cleaving rather too closely to traditional, outdated, false notions of what knowledge is in the first place. I like to say that Popper is the philosopher of common sense, so man on the street generally has a Popperian notion of what knowledge is. But academia is very much saturated in, well, academic notions of what knowledge is, and increasingly generations of students appear to be inculcated with ways of thinking about knowledge and knowledge claims, which are more and more subjectivist. Where does this come from? Well, it comes from ultimately the ancients, but all the way through to today in modern incantations of this same sort of subjectivist notion of knowledge, there isn't much in the way of intellectual self-defense against subjectivist notions of knowledge. And so everyone's opinion then stands on equal footing, even with things that are not so much a matter of opinion as a matter of deciding between good explanations given certain evidence. If knowledge is, as the ancients thought, about justifying as true beliefs, then we can all have things justified to us in different ways and to different extents. Perhaps just our personal confidence or deep feelings on the matter are sufficient justifications. So when I know something to be true, I know it because I believe it and our beliefs may differ. So what we may know to be true may differ and what constitutes knowledge or even what constitutes knowledge of the physical world might very well come down in part, in many places, to subjective feelings. So we are at an interesting juncture. We, I say, people who might listen to this podcast, people in associated circles, because 
Just as Popper seems to be becoming more widely known than ever and a little more popular, what rises up to meet that increased popularity of Popper is this stark relativism and subjectivism that is certainly there in the academy and is spreading throughout the culture, as things in the academy tend to do. The antidote to this is simply more Popper and better Popper. Rather like the antidote to erroneous science, as many people like to say, is not superstition or non-science, but rather more science and better science. More error correction, better error correction. So relativism in biology, the creeping wokeism, the emotions surrounding climate change, the absolute terror surrounding certain diseases, the drift towards collectivism driven by a desire to feel more safe, to feel more altruistic and to feel more certain in the face of doubt. These are all errors and they need a counter and almost all the responses I see to this are not able to appeal to a genuinely objective response, a genuinely objective standard for knowledge. They can only craft something they claim is objective, but when one prods just a little, we find feelings and emotions again at the core of what they're saying. So what am I talking about with regards to these outdated types of epistemology and outdated notions of knowledge? Well, let's look at my favorite three that I've mentioned many times before. They will be one, the received wisdom from academia on these topics, which is Plato's view of knowledge, more or less. The more modern version is the second kind, which is Bayesianism. And the pretender to the throne, in some ways, that epistemology that calls itself objectivist epistemology, but isn't anything like it, really. So firstly, the standard modern academic take on these things. And it even came up in that other book that I'm going through at the moment, Stephen Pinker's Rationality. So even as late as when I'm going through the science of Canon Kant, people are still publishing books taking for granted justified true belief. That is the standard academic take. And we know it's the standard academic take even today because the great Stephen Pinker himself takes it as gospel. It takes it simply as read that this is what knowledge is. We say we can know something on this view if we are justified in believing the claim to be true. So in this vision, knowledge is about believing something. It is the peculiar goings-on, the psychology of a mind. This is not objective, but subjective. It is about a believing subject. So that's a vision of knowledge condemned to subjectivity. It is about a personal, subjective experience of believing something and then saying, well, therefore, that's knowledge or I know the thing. The more modern incantation of this tries to rescue things by mathematizing this notion, and it's called Bayesianism. Here we do not give up the notion of justified true beliefs. We just take on a new character for the justifications. We try to make the justification objective out there in the world by saying it is somehow about objective measurements there in the world, which once you do this measurement in some way or other, you end up having more credence for a claim. And of course, if you put a mathematical veneer on something, then it lends a certain respectability to your so-called objectivity. With Bayesianism, I think we can almost do away with it in the same way that we would do away with any claim which corresponds to the old adage of lies, damned lies, and statistics. Nevertheless, on this view of Bayesianism, there is a claim that we can know something to a greater or lesser degree if there is evidence for the thing. And yes, many Bayesians will say that if there's evidence against a thing, then the probability of that thing being true drops to zero. But if you have some evidence and then you gain more evidence, then the more evidence that you gather, the more credence the claim gets, which is strange for a Popperian and pointless. As we like to say, it's very rare we have competing theories anyway. We usually have only one theory going. And the reason we have one theory going is all others have been reduced to probability zero because we find out that they're literally not true. But in Bayesianism, what is this credence anyway? Well, it's something like degree of truth or confirmation. In fact, Bayesianism itself sometimes calls itself Bayesian confirmation theory. So it's about confirmation. And even where Bayesians try to be objective, the fact remains that the entire epistemology is about assigning probabilities 
to claims. And it's this process of assigning, this process of coming up with some kind of objective number to put on your claim that is the subjective part. But what can it mean for any claim like, for example, the Earth orbits the Sun to have a probability of 50% or 90% or 95%? And who decides anyway? Either the Earth is objectively orbiting the Sun, in which case the probability of that happening is 1, or it's not, in which case the probability is 0, meaning that any calculation is completely and utterly pointless, certainly in the physical sciences anyway. By what mechanism can we come up with these probabilities? And as we might say, what is the alternative anyway? Real physical reality either is the way that we explain it is, or it's not. We either have probabilities of things actually being the case, or they're not the case. It's one or it's zero. So the fact is that Bayesianism itself is refuted by physics before it even gets its laces done up. The universe is not probabilistic. And so epistemology cannot be about probabilities. It must be about what is the case. And what we mean by what is the case is what our best knowledge tells us is the case. The epistemology makes ontological claims about reality. It says what exists, and that is the only way we know what exists via the explanations that tell us, with probability one, what exists, and probability zero, what doesn't exist. And in between, we just have a whole bunch of things that we don't know, and it's pointless speculating upon until we have a good explanation of those things. And lastly, for these outdated, refuted, old notions of what knowledge is, we have that epistemology that calls itself Objectivism, which to be fair is a broader philosophy, more or less about how to live one's life. It's very much self-help. But there is something which calls itself objectivist epistemology, so we need to address it. Here's a book all about it by Ayn Rand and some of her followers. But reading this book, which I have, it seems to suggest we have two ways of getting to knowledge. And basically the entire vision of knowledge isn't any more advanced than what was gifted to us by David Hume. Either we're getting knowledge via a process of derivation. Uh, well, let me quote from the book. What Ayn Rand writes there is that, quote, axioms are usually considered to be propositions identifying a fundamental self-evident truth. But explicit propositions as such are not primaries. They are made of concepts. The base of man's knowledge of all other concepts, all axioms, propositions, and thought consists of axiomatic concepts, end quote. So in that mood, knowledge production is about simply beginning with the axioms and then deriving what is true from them. And Ayn Rand, of course, and perhaps I'll get to this as well, she is very much an empiricist in this sense, that you simply see truth in the world, you can see what is self-evident, and from that self-evident truth, there's no need to interpret anything here, knowledge on this view, or rather observations on this view, are not theory-laden, they are simply true in and of themselves. And once you know what is true in and of itself, you derive, like a mathematician, what the truth of the rest of your explanatory framework will be. I think this is a complete and utter dead end, of course. We need to interpret our observations. Nothing is as it seems, almost. Let's not get into that now. To give Ayn Rand credit, she doesn't say that all knowledge is like this. Elsewhere she says, and I quote, this is where um, you can't do derivations of that kind. She says, quote, The process of observing the facts of reality and of integrating them into concepts is, in essence, a process of induction. The process of subsuming new instances under a known concept is, in essence, a process of deduction, end quote. And yes, by induction, she really does mean the kind of induction that Hume raised the problem of. How do you ever realize these universal claims about reality, given a limited number of observations? So she gets what science is all about completely wrong anyway. So there's very little in the work about science as an explanatory exercise. It's all about science being a predictive exercise and making these universal claims like, you know, all swans are white or something like that, as if that has anything really to do with how science works. So 
in this objectivist epistemology, this so-called objectivist epistemology, it is taken for granted that induction is real and we simply observe the facts of reality. So there exists direct observation on this view. And further, induction is an unproblematic process of generalization. Whatever the case, we do not escape from justified true belief. And so to that extent, objectivism, like all the other, like those other two kinds of epistemology I just mentioned, must fall back onto feelings about whether or not one is confident, one has justified something and one believes something, it's all happening inside of a human mind. There's very little that's out there in the objective world, the world of objects, that enables one to determine whether or not one has an objective knowledge claim, a claim that is, in fact, a claim that could be true or false, independent of whether or not anyone thinks it is true or false. Now, leaving behind the really strict academic stuff, whether it's um, looking at what the ancient Greeks said and what academic philosophers today debate about, what Ayn Rand said or what a modern Bayesian might say, popular accounts of knowledge today that you might find in a Scientific American piece, which I'll come to, are really no better. They get no closer to actually explaining about how existing theories came to be, how it is those theories could be overturned and by what mechanism, nor ever really grapple with what knowledge is in some fundamental sense. For example, the Scientific American, here I'll just read, I'll put up on the screen now, a quote from this Scientific American article. It reads, quote, Popper's view of the scientific method that's meant to get around the problem of induction might blow the young scientist's mind and convince him that the goal of objective knowledge is unattainable. This would probably undermine his efforts to build objective knowledge in the lab, end quote. So, well, all I can say is, wow, um, this is what can get printed in something like the scientific American talking about science and about Popper. It's proof positive, I would say, the author could not possibly have read Popper. I mean, to come away from reading Popper to conclude that someone might conclude objective knowledge is not possible is not merely to misunderstand Popper, it's to ignore him entirely. He wrote, after all, an entire book on that exact topic. By the way, the author of that piece says he is a philosopher of science. This is the academic poverty that is the philosophy of science, even today in the 21st century, and the poverty of epistemology. And it is why. It really is genuinely a reason why people end up debating emotions around matters of scientific importance. And New Scientist here, on the other hand, says that science is about faith and that we should not lose faith in science. So there are many, many misconceptions out there about the nature of objective knowledge. None of these ideas actually hit the nail on the head about what objectivity is, and objectivity in both senses, as I like to say. There's objectivity in the epistemological sense and there's objectivity in the ontological sense. They're very closely related and in many situations you could probably interchange them. But what I would say in the epistemological sense, following Popper, knowledge is objective precisely because it's not about feelings. It is not about subjective feelings of confidence nor the subjective contents of individual minds like belief. It is rather about whether a piece of knowledge objectively solves some problem or not, whether the answer is given or not, whether an error is corrected or not. None of this has anything to do with feelings of confidence, feelings of certainty. We simply know. How is it that the sun produces so much heat and light? That's a genuine problem, absent nuclear physics especially, because, so the history goes, prior to about 1900, biologists and geologists were able to estimate the age of the Earth. And they estimated it to be, well, at least hundreds of millions, and some even suggested billions of years old. Well, that's fine. 
The problem then is, if the only known way at that time to produce heat and light of the kind we see from the sun is a fire, combustion, a chemical reaction, then the sun should long ago have consumed itself in that fire. It's a standard astrophysics problem for undergraduates, actually. Given the mass of the sun, how long will it take, given the luminosity of the sun, for it to consume all of its hydrogen material if it was being burned in the same way that a fire on the earth is burning. Well, it would actually last about 20,000 years. That's how long it would take to consume all of the matter in the sun at the rate at which it's burning it, given it was a combustion reaction. But it's not a combustion reaction. But people before 1900 didn't have a clue that it wasn't a normal combustion reaction. Well, they might have had a clue because they realised that the sums weren't adding up. They knew they must have been making a mistake. So they had a problem, how to square the approximate known age of the Earth, hundreds of millions to billions of years, it happens to be 4.54 billion, we know that now, but at least then they knew it wasn't 20,000 years. How to square this huge number with the 20,000 year old sun, maximum of 20,000 year old sun. It's a problem, that's a problem. But once we have an understanding of nuclear physics in the early 21st century, then we can say, that problem is objectively solved. Nuclear physics explains that the amount of matter in the sun is more than sufficient to keep it burning via nuclear reactions for 12 billion years or more. There, problem solved. That bit of knowledge is objective. The question is objectively answered. The problem solved, and it's not about anyone being confident in that answer. How confident a physicist is, any particular physicist is in the answer, is beside the point. That is the answer, and the only known answer, and notice that no one needs to even believe it. Certainly not a consensus of people need to believe it or understand it for it to count as knowledge out there in the world, objectively solving the problem and correcting the error that the sun must have been like any other burning object, like a lump of wood that we are familiar with undergoing combustion in the presence of oxygen. And very importantly, we should notice that that same knowledge now, that same knowledge that solved the problem of how it was that the sun persisted in burning for so long, is now being used, again imperfectly, sure, but it is being used to drive the push towards artificial, earth-based nuclear fusion reactors. And guess what? That knowledge is there now. That knowledge of nuclear physics is there, instantiated in a nuclear fusion reactor. And should everyone, all the scientists who know how that thing operates, if they were to die tomorrow but leave behind the reactor itself, the knowledge is very largely preserved because should other people come along and whether or not they've got the manuals to operate this thing or not, could study closely the operation of their reactor itself, they would uncover the knowledge in that object. They could uncover that the fusion reactor actually instantiates in its super high temperature plasma producing lasers a way of overcoming the electrostatic force of repulsion of hydrogen nuclei to fuse them into another chemical altogether and in the process release vast quantities of energy. The knowledge of how to do that is literally in the reactor. The same relationships exist between the components of the reactor as existed in the minds of those now gone scientists and can now be recreated, literally recreated, mind you, in the minds of anyone who focuses sufficiently on how the reactor is doing what it is doing. So that is what we mean by objective. What Popper means by objective knowledge? It means it does not come down to subjective mental states. It comes down to whether epistemologically that a claim really solves a problem or not. And we might say, following Searle, objectively in the ontological sense as well, that knowledge is there in the object. And so it's not about the particular contents of any individual mind. That is not what makes knowledge objective. And there is no way of making knowledge objective in that way, no matter what the the Bayesians say, or what Rand says, or what the ancient Greeks say, or what some scientists or some popularizers of science or philosophy claim today. 
Objective knowledge is objective knowledge in the same way that electrons are electrons. It's not because Popper says it is what it is. It just is what it is. Millikan or Wolfgang Pauli might have had a view on the electron. We don't say the electron is what it is because Wolfgang Pauli said this or that. We just say what the electron is. So too with objective knowledge. It's not a matter of opinion. It is what it is. And just as with the electron, we can improve our understanding of it over time. But that improves improvement won't lead us in the direction of, well, maybe it's about feelings after all. We no more expect that than we expect our understanding of electrons to go back to J.J. Thompson's 1904 plum pudding model of the atom. That model was refuted then, it's been replaced, and we're moving forward. I say all of that by way of long preamble because we are moving forward today. We take Popper, and now we add what Deutsch and Marletto have said about knowledge. So let's finally begin with some reading. I'll be skipping the first few pages in which Chiara recalls a story from her childhood, and I'll just relate it to you now in my own words, when she comes across this little hole in the garden of her home where she once lived, and this little hole, eventually it turns out, even when it was disturbed, the perfect little hole in the ground was disturbed by putting leaves on it or disturbing it in some other way. The next day it would be repaired perfectly as a little hole. And it turns out the little hole was being repaired by a mole cricket, a little cricket which would recraft the hole once it had been disturbed. So the hole was persisting over time. And that is, of course, going to lead us into this concept of knowledge as being resilient information in some way or other. And there's something, there's some entity that is causing the ability of that system to remain in place over time. So let me pick it up on page 140 of The Science of Ken and Kant. And Chiara writes, quote, most changes or transformations that happen reliably around us require something to stay unchanged. In the case of my story, the things that undergo a transformation are the soil and the grass around where the hole is built. The thing that stays unchanged is the cricket. To be precise, the cricket stays unchanged only in a particular respect. What stays unchanged are all the features that make it capable of building a hole. For instance, it's strong forelimbs, which are shaped like shovels, and even armed with sawtooth edges to excavate more efficiently. This guarantees that the hole can be kept roughly in the same shape for much longer than the time over which the environment operates with its inexorable erosion. Pausing there, my reflection. So here we're getting a hint of the, the, there's these two kinds of knowledge in the world and um, Chiara doesn't uh, distinguish between these two because she's got a unified concept of knowledge. But the two versions that David Deutsch talks about are the knowledge of the genetic kind in the DNA of organisms and which arose via evolution by natural selection and the knowledge that appears inside the peculiar minds of people, which is this explanatory knowledge which arises via a process of creative conjecture and refutation. And so here we have an example of the kind of knowledge that arises through evolution by natural selection. And what we have is, I guess, a vision of uh, Dawkins extended phenotype, this, um, this idea that the DNA inside of an organism actually reaches out beyond its own body. And so encoded somewhere in the DNA of the cricket is a code for building little holes. And so the DNA actually reaches out into the external environment beyond the body of the cricket into uh, the soil. And, and constructing holes in the soil. So there is, there, is, there is abstract knowledge in the DNA of the cricket. The cricket is a physical instantiation, a kind of catalyst of a sort. The thing that if you disturb the hole, if you muck up the hole, if you go and put a stick in the hole and you know just destroy the, the little cricket's um, habitat, then it will repair it. And so the hole will persist. Why will the hole persist? Because the knowledge is there able to do the job of repairing. Okay, back to the book. Kiara writes, any transformation happening reliably with a high accuracy, such as making a perfectly round tunnel, requires something, such as the cricket, that stays unchanged in its being capable of causing it again. The entity must retain that property because that is necessary for the transformation to happen reliably. To clarify the point, 
in the hole making transformation, things like enough space and soil and the cricket are all necessary. But as I said, it is only the cricket that remains the same before and after the transformation. In some respect, the soil gets abraded away, the space is used up by the hole and so on, but the cricket, for its lifespan, is very nearly unchanged in that key ability. Things that can perform a transformation and retain the property of doing so repeatedly, such as the cricket, deserve a unifying name. Catalysts is a good one. Here one has to be careful because I am borrowing the term from chemistry to indicate a much more general class of systems than chemical catalysts. Chemical catalysts are entities that make a chemical reaction happen more quickly and faster when they are present, and that retain the property to do so over and over again. They operate a bit like facilitators. When all the other reagents are around, but the catalysts are not there, it takes ages for the reaction to happen, and other reactions may well consume the reagents first. But if catalysts are present, then the reaction happens quickly and deterministically. Since chemical catalysts are distinguished from reagents because they do not change while everything else does, I shall use catalyst to indicate systems that can cause a transformation and retain the property to do so, like the cricket in my story, pausing near my reflection. So I might just mention my favourite catalysts, class of catalysts here, which are the catalysts that allow for the Arbor process. The Arbor process being the combination of gaseous nitrogen with gaseous hydrogen in order to produce ammonia. This is a remarkable life-saving reaction and is just one of those wonderful examples where we show that we really have made objective progress in the world. Science really does help everyone on the planet. Industrialization is a wonderful thing and so on and so forth. The problem is how to make arid land able to grow crops. The overwhelming majority of land on planet Earth, where there is land, can't be used to grow crops because the soil isn't fertile enough. What it needs to have in it is nitrogen. Nitrogen fixed, so they say, in the soil. What scientists knew was that, well, you could use ammonia to make artificial fertilizers in order to make the soil fertile and therefore grow more crops. But the, the question is, how do you make ammonia? How do you get sufficient quantities of ammonia in the first place? Well, they knew of a reaction. A reaction was, well, this one here, you just take nitrogen, and you take hydrogen, and then you produce ammonia. But, big issue, it's not really a spontaneous reaction. You don't just mix gaseous nitrogen and gaseous hydrogen and then get ammonia at the end. It doesn't work that way. Even if you pressurize it and you use high temperature, it still doesn't work very well. But, if you add a catalyst of the right kind, and very many different kinds of catalysts are used. I think one is powdered iron, but there are all sorts of other fancy kinds that these guys arbor firstly, I think. But once you, once you have the right catalyst and you manage to figure out the most efficient temperature and pressure, then once you put it in the right vessel with the catalyst, the nitrogen and the hydrogen, then you get vast quantities of ammonia being produced. You get lots and lots of the stuff. And so this literally, this reaction, these catalysts have saved countless people's lives. They have fed countless hundreds of millions one would want to say maybe billions of people's lives we we're able to support so many more people on planet earth precisely because of this reaction it is a wonderful lesson about science and progress and might i say so-called artificial chemicals after all if anything is artificial it's this process it is very hard to do it doesn't happen spontaneously very easily certainly not with the efficiency required creating the volumes required so this is a very much a man-made, knowledge-based way of feeding the world using lots of chemicals in order to encourage the growth of plants. Now, what Chiara is, of course, talking about when it comes to catalysts here, knowledge as being a special kind of catalyst, we have the, the knowledge itself, well, in the form of the cricket here, we have the, the cricket being the catalyst which enables the construction of the hole over and over again, the construction of the burrow over and over again, that even when the burrow is disturbed or destroyed, along comes the cricket and it will just keep on rebuilding that thing over and over again. But the cricket itself is not changed, even if the burrow is. And as she will come to shortly, as Kiara will come to, the knowledge 
has to be in an abstract form inside of the cricket. And that would be in the, the DNA program, so to speak, for constructing a cricket. That program for constructing the cricket, building the cricket from the material out of which the cricket itself is made, would also code for holes in the ground which can house a cricket. And so that is a very specialised kind of knowledge. One then wonders, and I wonder, can there be a universal knowledge catalyst of this kind, a universal abstract catalyst which can transform anything into anything else that's known? Well, this is what a person is, one presumes. The, the program for a person is that kind of universal catalyst which can take material of any kind and with the relevant knowledge could construct any other thing that is constructible. <laughs> so that is what um, a person might turn out fundamentally to be or more fundamentally to be. But we get ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to the book. Chiara writes, quote, Why are catalysts in this generalized sense interesting? Answering this question will require one to understand the link between catalyst and knowledge, as I introduced in chapter one. The reason is that most systems undergo changes during processes that involve them, i.e. they do not stay the same, unlike catalysts. Also, most transformations in physics do not happen reliably. Those that do require a catalyst that can perform them. Catalysts, and likewise highly accurately performed transformations, are hard to come by. Some of you might be suspicious of the notion of hard to come by. It sounds too subjective. What looks hard to realise for some might be very easy for others. Actually, that is not the case. Hard to come by has an objective meaning established by the laws of physics. One thing is harder to come by than another in this sense if the former requires, compared with the latter, more of what is naturally given by the laws of physics for it to emerge. This notion is objective because what the elementary elements are, things like energy, time, elementary chemicals and so on, is set by the laws of physics. Take a look around and see what is not hard to come by. What the laws of physics gave us in abundance are things like elementary particles and fields, entities which, as we have learnt via modern physics, are used to explain the existence of elementary particles themselves and their mutual interactions. For example, if we see electrons and protons being attracted by what, classically, we would call the electrostatic force, we do not have to invoke anything else but the laws of physics to explain that attraction. I call things that are given in abundance in our universe, such as fields and particles, naturally occurring systems. And likewise, the interactions that need no more than the laws of physics, as we know them, to be explained fully, I call naturally occurring interactions. Among these naturally occurring systems and interactions, there are a few accurately and reliably performed transformations. For example, the planetary orbits around the Sun are almost elliptical. So one could say the task of making the planets describe elliptical orbits is well approximated in nature. This fact is a direct consequence of naturally occurring interactions because there is a symmetry in the gravitational potential that causes the orbits to have approximately that shape. In the case of such transformations, what has to stay unchanged for them to be performed to a high degree of reliability, the catalysts, are just the underlying physical laws which do not require further explanation. Pausing there my reflection. So, yeah, for, for stuff that we see out there happening, for example, planetary laws. And um, uh, incidentally, there's a wonderful conversation at a very high level, I would say, a technically high level, that Sean Carroll, the physicist on his Mindscape podcast, has with Chiara Maletta. That's worth looking up and listening to. Uh, Sean actually brings up the case of orbits, planetary orbits, because it would seem that we have good explanations of planetary orbits using various other models. I mean, we could use Kepler's laws of physics and we could say, well, Kepler's laws of physics actually uh, somehow come out of Newton's law of gravity, of course. What do we, how can constructor theory uh, ha say anything about this particular situation of planetary orbits? Well, well, there it is. There it is in the sense that what the laws of physics are are like a catalyst, a catalyst that itself remains unchanged while causing the position of a planet around a star to change. 
That's the thing that is changing over time. But the laws of physics aren't changing. They're the one thing that remains unchanged while all these transformations are going on out there in the physical universe. In astronomy, whenever you have one body orbiting another, it's a, another way of approaching the same physical situation, namely that of planetary orbits. So let's go back to the book. More on catalysts of this kind. Quote, but most of these kinds of transformations are not like that. There's more to them. Some non-elementary catalyst must be present for them to be performed to high accuracy. Think again of the hole in the grass being formed and reformed. That is not directly explainable given the laws of physics because there are no naturally occurring interactions that cause tiny holes in the grass to materialize and be maintained to a high accuracy, unlike planetary orbits. The mole cricket's holes in the grass, of course, obey the laws of physics, but to explain their persistence, we need some additional bit of explanation involving the cricket. Likewise, to explain most transformations that happen accurately and reliably, we need some additional explanation. This explanation will involve the concept of a catalyst, but also of information as defined in Chapter 3 in terms of counterfactuals. It will involve a particular type of information, which can enable its self-perpetuation. In Chapter 1, I called it knowledge. To explain how most transformations happen to a high degree of accuracy, in other words, we need to resort to a new class of counterfactuals. Pausing there, my reflection. Yes, I've made a big deal of this over some recent podcasts of mine, some very recent episodes. The big deal being people will sometimes, uh, the determinists will say, well, everything just obeys the laws of physics as if that's an explanation. But it's not an explanation. Uh, it's true. Something can be true and yet be next to irrelevant to the question at hand. Uh, it's almost vacuous, it's not utterly vacuous, of course, to say everything that happens out there in the physical universe, the universe, obeys the laws of physics. But that gets you not very far unless you're trying to explain exceedingly simple systems like planets orbiting stars, planetary orbits. Yes, then you can explain that purely in terms of laws of physics. Or when you have subatomic particles interacting can be explained purely in terms of laws of physics. You might even say that, you know, classically the high school undergraduate physics situation of some object sliding down a frictionless ramp can be explained purely in terms of laws of physics. Although there you might have a little bit of a problem because even there one might wonder why is that object going down <laughs> the frictionless plane? Uh, did someone let it go? And if so, why? So then we start to expand out. With planetary orbits, we don't need to worry about the why, who put that object in orbit. We have other explanations for that. The reductive explanation actually gets you all the way to the answer for that. So as, as Chiara says here, it's not really informative to say that something like a cricket building a burrow is simply obeying the laws of physics. That's not enough. That's not going to be able to explain what's going on. You need something deeper. There's knowledge there in the DNA of that cricket. And that cricket then is able to construct the whole because somewhere in that DNA of the cricket, there is code for building holes. Okay, so now I'm going to skip um, quite a long passage, quite, quite a fair a few paragraphs. And Chiara talks about, well, what would it take to stop the building of holes in gardens of the kind that the cricket builds? Well, maybe in an extreme case, you might say, well, kill the cricket. But as she says, no, that won't be enough. Killing that cricket won't stop holes being built by crickets in general. As she says, even if you were to destroy all the crickets in your garden, there would be something that survives, and that is the genome that codes for the mole cricket. The genome is information, as I said in Chapter 3, because it can be copied during DNA replication. So what you really should destroy is that piece of information. If that is not destroyed, the cricket could always be brought back to life via some laboratory experiment along the lines of what happened in the film Jurassic Park. And that would cause the whole making transformation to happen again and again, just as before. So that piece of information contained in the genome is the thing that you would ultimately have to destroy in order for the mole cricket activity to cease forever. So the genome is the thing one would have to exterminate in order to stop the transformations caused by a living entity. 
Um, now I'm going to skip the next part where Kiara relates a story. Uh, Kiara tells this story, and the story is basically about how well it's a it's a science fiction story um, that she read as a child, or um, her father told her as a child, about how in the future humans are trying to help these aliens who are infected by a bacterial disease, and the way they help the aliens is by programming nanobots with the genome, essentially the DNA of the bacterium, in order to have the nanobots attack the bacterium and so the, the the nano robots the miniature robots are able to get into the bacterium and destroy that sequence of the genome to prevent the bacterium from replicating it's something like that anyway <laughs> but the the point here is that the genome contains information information of what kind is it abstract yes let's go back to the book chiara says quote the genome is not an ordinary catalyst. It has two additional properties. It is information because it can be copied in the process of DNA replication and it causes itself to remain instantiated in physical systems over generations because it guarantees that the organism for which it codes can survive in a certain environment. I shall call this type of information an abstract catalyst. Catalyst, as I said, because it can enable transformations and retain the property of causing them again. Abstract, because its identity does not depend on the physical systems in which it is embodied. It can be copied from one embodiment to another without changing its properties. It could be in DNA or in a nanorobot's computer. According to our criteria in Chapter 3, an abstract catalyst is made of information, for it is copyable. Also, it is information that is capable of enabling its own preservation. In the terminology of Chapter 1, it contains knowledge. End quote. Just my quick reflection here. Yeah, so we already know that DNA is a form of abstract knowledge because we can read DNA. We can sequence the genome, which means that we take whatever information is in the DNA of the cells of a human or any other organism can be taken and in a laboratory, a printout made and stored in a computer. And then in even the further distant future, you would be able to take whatever that readout is in the computer where that information is in an abstract form. It's not made of... DNA stuff. It's not made of a double helix. Instead, it is made of zeros and ones being represented inside of a computer. But that information could then be taken and then turned back into DNA, which is the double helix. And this is what it means for something to be abstract. Abstract information means that it is substrate independent. It doesn't matter whether it's actually physical DNA, zeros and ones in a computer, or in a possibly ridiculous case, writing it out in handwritten AGTC sequences of base pairs on a piece of paper. That could in principle be done. But all of those, whether it's the physical DNA itself, whether it's the zeros and ones in a computer, whether it's AGTC written on pieces of paper, would all represent the same bit of knowledge, that bit of knowledge which codes for the construction of some organism represented by that DNA. Back to the book. And Kiara writes, quote, Before moving on, I want to clarify something important. I just said that a catalyst can enable or cause transformations on physical systems. Truth be told, the term causation has acquired, especially in physics circles, a bad reputation. Saying that a catalyst has the ability to cause certain transformations could therefore be misunderstood for one of these bad ways of looking at a cause, but it isn't. When we say that the catalyst causes a transformation, we mean simply that the transformation occurs only when the catalyst is available and that the catalyst retains the property of making the transformation occur over and over again. Although other notions of causes are problematic and seem arbitrary in physics, this one is not because it is clear when some system is or is not a catalyst. For instance, one can say that the catalyst that produced a blue-green algae cell is the parent cell that originated it via self-reproduction. Indeed, the parent cell is the particular cell that is capable of constructing the daughter cell by using the information in the DNA. The DNA and the rest of the cell in this context are only systems necessary to the transformation, which also stay the same in the ability to enable the transformation again before and after the transformation. 
The retention of this ability is a distinctive and objective feature of the catalyst which does not apply to other elements in the environment. For any transformation that occurs in physical reality, one can unambiguously identify a catalyst that is capable of realizing it and of retaining the ability to cause it again. It is the catalyst for the transformation. One can think of it as a cause of the transformation. How do we distinguish abstract catalysts from other kinds of information? We need to look for information that can enable transformations and is resilient. Again, biology seems to provide a useful example where abstract catalysts are distinguished from genetic information. Think of a plant, for instance, a maritime pine tree standing on the Ligurian coast. Even before visualizing the tree, one can perceive its scent. After the rain, molecules of particular chemicals called terpenes are released by the tree and cause the air to be permeated with that characteristic fragrance. Zooming in, one can take a closer look at the minute green needles that line the tree's branches. Going in closer still, one reaches the level of a single cell of the pine tree. Closer still, and one is looking at a DNA strand inside the cell. Let's look for the abstract catalysts in the cell. Every part of the DNA strand in the cell contains information in the sense I explained earlier in this book. This is because the strand is copyable. It is copied in the process of DNA replication when cells reproduce. However, only some pieces of that DNA strand code for something. These bits are what biologists would call adaptations. An adaptation, as already mentioned in chapter one, is a piece of information in the DNA with the ability to enable a certain trait to emerge in the organism that hosts the DNA. We say that it codes for that particular trait. For instance, there is a bit of DNA that codes for the color of the pine needles, such as that particular shade of green that, that pine trees have. However, not all adaptations are resilient, which is the other salient property of abstract catalysts. To be resilient in a given environment, an adaptation needs to be useful. It must increase the probability that the genes that code for it will be passed on to the next generation and preserved for generations in that given environment. Pausing there, my reflection. There we get useful. So remember we have this three-pronged Popperian Deutsch notion of what knowledge is. And Chiara is adding to that with the notion of resilience, but it captures this same idea of knowledge on the one hand being that kind of information which once instantiated somewhere tends to cause itself to remain so. I love that. It's nice and poetic. But we can also say succinctly that knowledge is useful information. Now, one might very well ask, what does it mean to say useful? What I would say is that there's the third part of this little fork of different ways of coming to an understanding of what knowledge is in this Popperian framework. That being, knowledge is information that solves a problem. And the problem here might be how to be passed on to the next generation, how it is that the species, the genes, whatever, you, however you want to frame this, um, the, the organism continues to survive or at least passes on its genes to the next generation so that that uh, species continues to survive because the genes continue to survive. Okay, I'm skipping apart and I'm just picking it up where Kiara writes, quote, being a useful adaptation guarantees the survival of that piece of information with causal abilities. It is what guarantees that it is resilient and that it qualifies as an abstract catalyst. So the information in a piece of DNA may or may not be an abstract catalyst, depending on whether or not it can propagate itself for generations, thus remaining instantiated in physical systems. Generalizing from this biology example, information that can enable transformations on physical systems must also be resilient in order to qualify as an abstract catalyst. So catalysts are systems that can enable transformations and retain the ability to cause them again. Abstract catalysts are catalysts that are copyable and can perpetuate themselves. They are catalysts made of resilient information, which we call knowledge. Just pausing there, going back and just repeating that because that's knowledge dense there. <laughs> knowledge density about knowledge. Again, abstract catalysts are catalysts that are copyable and can perpetuate themselves. They are catalysts made of resilient information, which we call knowledge. In other words, knowledge is resilient information, as we learned in Chapter 1 of The Science of Kant. Let's keep going. Gower writes, 
Now, an intriguing fact that I'm about to explain is that all catalysts must contain an abstract catalyst. Catalysts, in other words, must have some properties that are invariant, no matter what transformation they are intended for, and that invariant part must be made of knowledge. As I'm about to illustrate, this remarkable fact is due to the particular structure of the laws of physics in our universe. Let's consider the example of assembling an aircraft from elementary components in the Airbus factory. The elementary components are the subparts of the plane, such as wings, engines, seats and wheels, but to be more expansive, we can think of the whole process that produces an aircraft out of even more elementary entities, such as metals, plastic and similar materials. The whole factory is the catalyst for this transformation. Where is the abstract catalyst? As I said, it is the thing that ultimately one has to eliminate for the factory to stop working properly. Okay, so pausing there my reflection so this idea of the abstract catalyst is that one crucial thing that would ensure that if you destroyed it you wouldn't have resilient information anymore resilient information is knowledge knowledge is that information which continues to get itself copied and replicated over time so what could possibly stop that destroying the abstract catalyst where is the abstract catalyst in this particular case you can probably guess continuing Chiara says Imagine a slight modification to the factory, for example, by introducing a flaw in its production line. If it is a well-run factory, there is a way to fix the problem and thus restore the production process, so that change is inconsequential for the output. However, if you destroy the sequence of instructions for constructing the plane, or the instructions for repairing the factory, the factory might have to shut down. The recipe for the aircraft must be copied for the factory to survive. It is the abstract catalyst that keeps the factory going for years. This recipe is the set of instructions to realise the construction of the aircraft to the accuracy set by the factory standards. It is a recipe in the sense that it is a sequence of steps that one has to follow in order to forge the metals into the shape of the plane. The recipe for a fully fledged aircraft is what allows the construction of the aircraft to happen reliably because the final product is checked against the procedure until it meets the criteria set by the quality control of the company. Also, the recipe is preserved down the line for decades, so it is what allows aircrafts to be produced over and over again. Sometimes the recipe can be slightly improved, but it is preserved in its ability to create an aircraft that can fly safely and swiftly. Thus, aside from all the various things that the factory contains, there is a particularly important piece of information which is copied from generation to generation in order for aircrafts to be produced to the factory standard. Losing this recipe would make the factory fade away. And even if an alien civilization were to find the remains of the aircraft factory, in order to make it functional again, they would have to find the recipe or figure it out themselves. The recipe is the abstract catalyst and it is made of knowledge. Pausing there in my reflection. And although Chiara doesn't say it here, one would presume that if the aliens found a non-functional factory, that's one thing, even if all the raw materials were there, but if the aliens also had aircraft, fully functioning aircraft, well then that aircraft contains the knowledge implicit, implicit, not explicit, but implicit within it of how to construct itself. If they were sufficiently careful and undid every nut and bolt very, very carefully, then they could rebuild the thing or they could replicate it. So a fully functioning aircraft over here could lead to, given a factory, another fully functioning copy of that aircraft over here. It'd be very hard. It's not the ideal way to do it. You'd rather have a plan written out. But in theory, you could deconstruct the aircraft, produce a plan, then reconstruct. Presumably, as long as you're error correcting very carefully, very accurately along the way. But in principle, it could be done. So this is the sense in which the knowledge is there in objects. It's objective knowledge. Another, for, another way of talking about this is, of course, reverse engineering. Let's keep going. Chiara writes, In order to be compatible with the laws of physics, we know the recipe must have the form of a sequence or combination of elementary steps. To see why, we must understand that the laws of physics do not contain any protocol to preserve or create complex entities such as aircrafts or even wings or things of that type. Leave an aircraft for a while in a desert without being repaired or checked and it will soon become unfit to fly. As I said in chapter one, the only thing that the laws of physics preserve directly 
are elementary components and interactions and elementary symmetries. They are no design laws. Ultimately, physical laws provide only very simple types of transformations that can be performed reliably without there being a recipe, those corresponding to naturally occurring interactions. These are transformations that happen spontaneously, such as the oxidation of the coating of an aluminium surface or the molecules of air in an oven heating up the surface of a cake. Such transformations are elementary steps that do not need further maintenance to be realised in a stable manner. In fact, they do not need to be specified in the recipe because they are implicit in the laws of physics. I've uncovered a regularity in the way abstract catalysts appear. They must be realized as a recipe, a sequence of elementary steps non-specific to the output, each of which does not require further explanation and which can be considered as a direct consequence of physical laws. Okay, that's wonderful there. Um, I'm going to skip a part where, well, basically, Kaori just talks about how in biology we're familiar with the appearance of design. Organisms have the appearance of design. It's as if there is a designer behind the design of various things. But we know now that's not the case, that evolution by natural selection explains how you can have this ratcheting up of complexity over time and the increasing appearance of sophisticated design. But of course, that appearance of design is better described as the illusion of design. Anyway, Kiara goes on to say, quote, whenever you see something with the appearance of design that can last a long time, you can rightly assume that some abstract catalyst is contained in it. I have said that most transformations that are possible in the physical world must occur via a catalyst that enables them. I have also noted that all catalysts must contain an abstract catalyst, which is itself made of knowledge, as introduced in chapter one. Knowledge is defined entirely via counterfactuals. It is information that is capable of remaining instantiated in physical systems. Unlike most definitions of knowledge, the good thing about this one is it does not depend upon there being a knowing subject. And oh yes, you better believe I'm going to repeat that. <laughs> Quote, Knowledge is defined entirely via counterfactuals. It is information that is capable of remaining instantiated in physical systems. Unlike most definitions of knowledge, the good thing about this one is that it does not depend, it does not depend on there being a knowing subject going on. This way of looking at knowledge based on counterfactuals breaks with a long-standing tradition, which regards it as a chiefly anthropomorphic, subjective concept. That tradition says that knowledge requires there to be a sentient being, such as a human, to exist. Knowledge, in other words, would only exist in minds. According to this idea, knowledge appears to be subjective. Something like that is very remote from the laws of physics. In contrast, knowledge as defined here, as it occurs in abstract catalysts, is sharply different. The main two differences are that this entity is objective. It can exist irrespective of whether there is a knowing subject, and it is a possible subject for physics. As I said, those who know the philosopher Karl Popper will recognise the chief features of his epistemology in the characteristics of this concept. However, with the science of Canon Kant, I have related knowledge to physics, something beyond the domain of epistemology, which we can do because we are using counterfactuals. In physics, there have been several discoveries of new types of stuff. For example, at some point it was realised that all engines use some type of energy, heat, and transform it partially into another type of energy, work. It was then natural to wonder how to express the laws about these two types of energy, and that gave rise to thermodynamics. Likewise, in this case, it is natural to wonder, can knowledge be created? Can it be destroyed? Can it be transformed? This problem is a deep one, and it is only partially solved so far. The science of Canon Kant provides an objective handle on knowledge. It gives us tools that may one day be used to answer these questions fully. Pausing there, my reflection. Isn't that wonderful? Anyone who is interested in philosophy, epistemology, and physics has a real opportunity to contribute to the frontiers of all those areas by investigating the science of Canon Kant reading about constructor theory, trying to push the frontiers forward in constructor theory. So anyway, young people out there listening, this would be a wonderful opportunity to go into an area which 
hasn't so far proved to be a dead end like many of those other kinds of uh, cutting edge areas of physics that have been around for many, many decades and don't seem to be doing too much in the way of making progress towards solving particular problems in physics. But bringing epistemology within the sphere of physics, physics has this, as David Deutsch has said before, this totalitarian character of gradually coming to encompass every other subject. And now epistemology, it's wonderful. So uh, this idea of counterfactuals being very much at the heart of what epistemology is about and whether it's possible for a thing to be known, for this particular knowledge to be constructed, whether this particular piece of knowledge can be created or not, is going to come down to physics. That's exciting stuff. Okay, I'm skipping um, a little bit and then I'm picking it up where we're just getting right to the end of the chapter. So this will be the last bit that I read from the book, from this book. And Kiara writes, quote, with this new perspective, we have a different angle on theories that deny that knowledge could be anything substantial or of scientific interest on the grounds that it might be associated with an anthropocentric attitude. There is nothing anthropocentric in abstract catalysts. Their capacity to enable transformations is objective. In fact, knowledge and knowledge-creating entities are singled out as significant properties of our universe. But this is not, as in religious explanations, because of some dogma. It is because of a physical explanation. Knowledge is a particular property that matter can have in our universe. Say that again. Knowledge is a particular property that matter can have in our universe, which exists when abstract catalysts are there. And it is fascinating to study its regularities, how it comes into existence, how it evolves, and whether it can be sustained and grow indefinitely. And this becomes, through this approach, via counterfactuals, a problem for physics. Maybe one day we will be able to solve it. End quote, end of chapter five. Isn't that wonderful? That is just absolute cutting edge epistemology. That is right at the edge of what is known about knowledge right now. That we now have this concept of an abstract catalyst, this thing that contains the information allowing the transformation of matter into some other kind of matter. And which, as I like to say, enables us to solve our problems. And just by way of, I suppose, showing due respect to the person that started all this, we have the very latest in what knowledge is about there from Chiara Marletto, following the work of David Deutsch. Let's have a look at what Popper actually said. It would be remiss of me to, to not read just something brief from objective knowledge, where Popper actually talks explicitly about objective knowledge. So again, just to hammer the point home that knowledge should not be seen as something about merely what people are thinking on a given topic, that knowledge really is out there in the world. Chiara's made that point forcefully there, that it is part of physics. Importantly, it is a property that matter can have in our universe. Where did this all start? Who kicked this off? Well, Popper himself. And he wrote, this is page 115 of the chapter that's called Epistemology Without a Knowing Subject. And he wrote, quote, One of the main reasons for the mistaken subjective approach to knowledge is the feeling that a book is nothing without a reader. Only if it is understood does it really become a book. Otherwise, it is just paper with black spots on it. This view is mistaken in many ways. A wasp's nest is a wasp's nest even after it has been deserted, even though it is never again used by wasps as a nest. A bird's nest is a bird's nest even if it was never lived in. Similarly, a book remains a book, a certain type of product, even if it is never read, as may easily happen nowadays. Moreover, a book or even a library need not even have been written by anybody. A series of books of logarithms, for example, may be produced and printed by a computer. It may be the best series of books of logarithms. It may contain logarithms up to, say, 50 decimal places. It may be sent out to libraries, but it may be found too cumbersome for use. At any rate, years may elapse before anyone uses it, and many figures in it which represent mathematical theorems, may never be looked at as long as men live on earth. 
Yet each of these figures contains what I call objective knowledge. And the question of whether or not I am entitled to call it by that name is of no interest. The example of these books of logarithms may seem far-fetched, but it is not. I should say that almost every book is like this. It contains objective knowledge, true or false, useful or useless. And whether anybody ever reads it and really grasps its contents is almost accidental. A man who reads a book with understanding is a rare creature. But even if he were more common, there would always be plenty of misunderstandings and misinterpretations. And it is not the actual and somewhat accidental avoidance of such misunderstandings, which turns black spots on white paper into a book or an instance of knowledge in the objective sense. Rather, it is something more abstract. It is its possibility or potentiality of being understood, its dispositional character of being understood or interpreted, or misunderstood or misinterpreted, which makes a thing a book. And this potentiality or disposition may exist without ever being actualized or realized. Pausing there, my reflection. So that's just worth lingering on there. It's about potential, possibility. Uh, the possibility or potential of being understood or misunderstood. So if something could possibly be understood, but never is, or possibly misunderstood, but never is, that's the point. It doesn't matter whether it actually is misunderstood or actually is understood. It's just that it could be understood or misunderstood. Therefore, it must contain knowledge of a kind, knowledge that is capable of being understood or misunderstood. And as he says, that it doesn't matter whether that's actualized or realized. That, 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 that's inherent within itself. Inherent within, as Chiara might say, it's a property of the matter itself. That that matter contains information that could be understood or not. Popper goes on to say, quote, To see this more clearly, we may imagine that after the human race has perished, some books or libraries may be found by some civilized successors of ours, no matter whether these are terrestrial animals, which have become more civilized, or some visitors from outer space. These books may be deciphered. They may be those logarithm tables, never read before for argument's sake. This makes it quite clear that neither its composition by thinking animals, nor the fact that it has not actually been read or understood, is essential for making a thing a book and that it is sufficient that it might be deciphered. Thus, I do admit that in order to belong to the third world of objective knowledge, a book should, in principle or virtually, be capable of being grasped or deciphered or understood or known by somebody. But I do not admit more. Okay, then Popper goes on to criticise a whole bunch of competing epistemologies, which are all very similar in very many ways. But <laughs> I can't let things go without mentioning this passage from Popper, which is um, skipping forward to page 141, where he has some remarks on probability theory. And he writes, quote, Nowhere has the subjectivist epistemology a stronger hold than the field of the calculus of probability. This calculus is a generalization of Boolean algebra, and thus of the logic of propositions, it is still widely interpreted in a subjective sense as a calculus of ignorance or of uncertain subjective knowledge. But this amounts to interpreting Boolean algebra, including the calculus of propositions, as a calculus of certain knowledge, of certain knowledge in the subjective sense. This is a consequence which few Bayesians, as the adherents of the subjective interpretation of the probability calculus now call themselves, will cherish. This subjective interpretation of the probability calculus I have combated for 33 years. Fundamentally, it springs from the same epistemic philosophy which attributes to the statement, I know that snow is white, a greater epistemic dignity than to the statement, snow is white. I do not see any reason why we should not attribute still greater epistemic dignity to the statement. In the light of all the available evidence to me, I believe that it is rational to believe that snow is white. The same could be done, of course, with probability statements. Okay, and obviously there is uh, far more to be gained by reading this in terms of understanding the nature of objective knowledge. But for now, I think we've covered everything from where it began, this notion of objective knowledge, to where we are as of 2021 and our appreciation of the cutting edge of epistemology, really, or where we are in the most modern sense, where we've done away with, criticised, refuted those other subjectivist notions of what knowledge is, which have 
plagued philosophers and unfortunately still plague um, especially academic philosophers even through to today and which students of philosophy are still taught and of course as we often complain here Popper simply isn't studied enough that um, people often have to leave the academic institutions in order to really get a handle on what Popper says about these important issues of objective knowledge, philosophy more broadly. But hopefully one day there might be an institution of some kind who wants to take on you know, degree programs in <laughs> Popper and uh, constructor theory. I'm sure that would be absolute anathema to David Deutsch, but... <laughs> But maybe it would be a completely non-coercive way of teaching a new generation of people how to make objective progress out there in the world. After all, at the moment, uh, the university seems to be in a, well, a difficult situation. Let's just say that. But for now, until next time when we are up to episode 99 of TopCast, which will be a special one. Episode 100 will be a special one, which will be the full interview with David Deutsch. And indeed, episode 101 and maybe 102 will be a special one as well. An Ask Me Anything episode. And um, my Patreons will get, will get first kick of the ball, so to speak, in asking me a question. They've asked me on Patreon. I've put the call out on Twitter if you'd like to ask me a question for an Ask Me Anything episode. I'm not planning on doing these uh, particularly regularly at this point, but uh, maybe episode 101 and episode 102 possibly will be devoted to me responding to questions from people um, who have questions about the last... 100 <laughs> episodes of TopCast. But until next time, bye-bye.